you've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. You're like, that's an awesome verse. I, man, I've been wanting that new house, that brand new car. I'm, I'm in God's house. I'm delighting myself in the Lord. Okay, bring it, God, you know. Well, that's not what it means. What David was saying is I submit myself to God, as I delight myself in the Lord, in His plan, His will, His ways, what I find is over a period of time, His will becomes my will. His direction becomes my direction. Submission can be viewed as a dirty word in today's society, but there's plenty of submission that's necessary in everyday life. How about submitting to the traffic laws so you don't get in a serious car accident? or keeping your children from drinking alcohol so they're not intoxicated by something that could poison them. In today's teaching, Pastor Ron helps you see submission in a positive light where you're submitting to God's will because it's better for you than your own will. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Ephesians chapter five with today's edition of Large Than Life. Now, some of you are natural born hunters when it comes to shopping. Or you're just natural born hunters. You know, you're, you're out on Friday, you're looking through the paper so that Saturday morning, you're up early in the morning, you're going to all the garage sales. Or you're saving up coupons all the time so that when you're in the store, you're buying up that opportunity. Here's the opportunity, expires now, I'm gonna use it. I have this opportunity, boom, there, there you go. Take that cash register. <laughs> I've seen some of you. You, got, you walk down the, the grocery store, you got this big old giant thing. And you're, I, I've seen you. I know who you are. But the idea is better to buy it up now until it expires and it's no good. Wouldn't be worth my while later. I think this is the attitude that we need to have as believers. We need to have that mentality that we only have this certain amount of time to live and we need to buy up or use those opportunities while they're available. Our time is brief, our time is short. You don't know how long you're gonna be living. Say, well, I might make 90, awesome. You may make 40. I'm past 40. Well, then you're in borrowed time, buddy. No, I don't know. You have a set amount of time. Because young people think that 40 is old. Man, 40, I've got tons of time. Oh, it'll happen like that, pal. It really does happen fast. But we need to buy up the opportunities, use them. There's a saying that says this, kill time, kill time, and you murder opportunity. Man, that's so true. So Paul is exhorting us in context to walk wisely instead of foolishly. And his point is this, the most foolish thing that we could do as a believer, outside of, of course, disobedience to God, is wasting time. Don't waste time. Sometimes we waste time by not doing anything at all. You can just, you're just not doing anything for the Lord. You're, you're wasting time. I just want you to know that. Well, I'm doing these things. Well, you're doing it for you, but you are here on this earth to glorify God. So if you're not serving the Lord, you're wasting time. But you could even be serving the Lord and not using all the opportunity. What do you mean by that? Well, you could serve God half-heartedly. There are people that do that, half-heartedly. Colossians 3, 23, though, says, whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it with everything you got for the Lord's glory. Again, our time is brief. And once it's lost, you can't get it back. So you gotta use the opportunity as they present themselves. I read about an ancient Greek statue. And uh, it was depicted with a man with wings on his feet. So imagine this guy's got wings on his feet. He's got a forelock on the front of his head, just like a ponytail front, and then ball. I could do this. I just want you to know, I could do that. I should have done it. Wings on the feet, forelock, and nothing behind. The placard on the statue says, opportunity, opportunity. And then this is what it reads, the inscription. Who made you? Lysippius made me. What is your name? My name is opportunity. Why do you have wings on your feet? That I might fly swiftly. Why do you have a great forelock? That men might seize me when I come. Why are you bald in the back? that when I'm gone, none can lay hold of me. That's opportunity. Opportunity is coming at you right now. Opportunity to serve the Lord is available. It's available here, it's available in the world. There's lots of places, opportunity is there. And it's here, grab hold of it. Because if you don't, when it's passed, it's gone. It's got wings, it's bald in the back, it's like me, Whew, there I go. <laughs> but you have to seize the opportunity. 
There's so much available. David had this in mind. In Psalm 39, verse 4, he said, Lord, make me to know my end. Lord, let me know that I've got an end, that I could die at any time, and the measure of my days, and how frail I am. I'm not going to be here very long. Behold, you've made my days like a hand breath. Just from here to there. In my age, it's nothing before you. I mean, compared to eternity, drop in a bucket. So David was saying, Lord, help me understand that my time is short so that I would seize the opportunities to worship you, to serve you, to hear from you. Paul, the apostle Paul had that thought. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, he said, uh, dealing with all the persecutions he was undertaking, he said, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. It's okay that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry I've received from the Lord. So Paul said, I go through a lot of things, but I see my life as a race. And all I want to do is keep running for him, buying up every opportunity, redeeming every moment for his glory. I'm not going to worry about someone's trying to take my life. This is him. I'm just going to keep serving the Lord. And he did. So that he comes to the end of his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the last words that he wrote, he said, I fought the good fight. I finished my course, and I kept the faith. And shortly after that, he was beheaded. He did it. He did it. Each of us have a race to run. For some of us, it'll be a long-distance race. It's going to be long. You're going to live a long time. I don't know who you are, but someone here is going to live a long time. Probably not me. I don't know. Some of you may live a shorter time. We don't know. But Paul says, redeem the time. Listen, do you realize that until your time is up, in one sense, you're invincible. Now, I'm not saying go out and tempt God. Go stand up and say, hey, I'm invincible. Psh, well, there you go. On. <laughs> but the, the point is this. If you're in the will of God, you just keep serving him. You're going to be here till the time is up. But you don't know when that is. So use every opportunity that you have. But think of the many opportunities we've lost. Now, that's not to look back, oh, man, you know, and bring it down. Or I think, though, there's a good time where we do look back and go, man, I, sh I should have done this. I should have done this. Okay, let that go now, but let's now live in the present. Because of that, I want to do this. I want to do that. I think of Noah, the days of Noah. You know, for 100 years, he was preaching the gospel. And then at the end of that time, God closed the ark. It was just he and his family in the ark, right? And people go, oh, man, God was so mean. He killed all those people for 100 years. For a hundred years, they had the opportunity. Repent. Give your life to God. They didn't. What a horrible thing. People missed that opportunity just to accept the Lord. I think of the parable of the marriage feast and the ten virgins. It's found in Matthew chapter 25. We'll be covering it in a few more weeks in the future. But there were five women who had oil ready all night for the lamps, and there are another five who didn't. They weren't ready for the Lord's return. And the others, they didn't have it. Well, you know, we I guess we better go get some. And while they were gone, Jesus Christ returned. And the five ladies were invited into the marriage supper of the Lamb. They were invited into heaven. The others were left out. And it says they were foolish in the parable. They were foolish. They missed the opportunity. Jesus went on to say right after that parable in Matthew 25, 13, watch therefore, because you don't know when the Lord is coming. Listen, the Lord could also come at any time. I could be living, but then Christ comes. Then what? Are you ready? I think the greatest example of lost opportunity in regard to salvation is Judas Iscariot. Here's a guy who walked with Jesus three years. Amazing. And he heard all that Jesus shared and taught. And Jesus was ever and always reaching out to him, but he kept rejecting it, kept rejecting it. And then he ultimately betrays the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And after a while, he didn't even realize that didn't even satisfy him. He just went back and threw it on the ground. What a sad thing. So let me, let me just say this, because maybe you're here, and I don't want you to miss the opportunity to give your life to Christ. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to the Lord. Then use this opportunity. Make this the night where you say, yes, Lord, yes. I want to invite you into my heart. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Isaiah 55, 6 says this, seek the Lord. Seek him while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. He's near tonight. He can be found in your heart tonight if you open up your heart to him. So don't brush it off for another day. So we don't want to think that, well, we've got all kinds of time to do whatever we want. There's a classic story. Jesus gave the parable of the farmer. Uh, let me read it to you. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus spoke a parable and said, there was a ground of a certain rich man that yielded plenty. So the guy was already loaded, and now he's got more crops making more. 
And he thought to himself, what am I going to do? I don't have room to store all my crops. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to pull down my barns and build bigger ones and store more stuff. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have so many goods laid up for so many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. So you know what? I'm just going to retire. It's going to be the good life, man. But God said to him, fool, fool, this night your soul is required of you. Then whose will those things be that you've prided? Then all those things you saved up, guess what? They're going to go to your relatives. What? That guy that was, yep, it's all going to him. And you're gone. So you never know. You never know when that time is. I prayed with a lady and she said, close friend just has a giant clot. They had to remove his skull and do all these things. Has no feeling, hasn't woken up yet. I said, does he know the Lord? Well, yeah, he knows God, but it hasn't been right with the Lord. I said, I bet God has his attention now. And we prayed for him. We prayed that, you know, that he would recover and have an opportunity. Uh, we'd love to see healed, but I'd love him to see accept Christ or follow with Christ. We just don't know. But let me say this, that this verse here, when it says redeeming the time, this is also for believers, as believers, we need to do that, right? As I've already kind of alluded to, we need to use the time that we have. I remember when Matthew was a, a young boy. He was five years old, and we'd pray in the morning for devotion like we did with our kids, and at night we'd pray with our kids. And there was a, this time where he, he'd end his prayer, and Lord, thank you for all my days. And really what he was thinking is, Lord, thank you for today. But he ended the prayer, thank you for my days. And we never corrected him because we thought, hey, that's actually really good. Thank you for my days, because we only have a allotted amount of days. Thank you for those days. We have these certain days. What do we do with it? We need to be thanking the Lord that we have this, this time. Notice, we have an appointed time, and we need to use it for God's glory. He adds at the end of verse 16, because the days are evil. <laughs> The days are evil. Think about this. Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? If the days were evil then, what are they now? Oh, they're bad. We're living at the time that Isaiah wrote when people are calling good evil and evil good. I mean, good grief. Our mayor in Houston, you know, signs over, just no voting on it, just signs over, yeah, men can now go in the girls' bathroom and girls in the men's bathroom. Are you sick? Are you, are, are you kidding me? That is foolish. Honestly, that's just not thinking. But we're living at such a, a ridiculous time. Ridiculous. Evil, evil, evil. By the way, we don't want to take anything away from the time of Paul. Paul is writing to the Ephesian believers, and they live in Ephesus, right? And that's the, the place of the worship to the temple of Diana, with all the temple prostitutes, male and female. It was decadent. It was horrible, right? And so he's saying you've got to redeem the times. I think it doesn't take anybody, half a brain knows that we're living in tough times. I mean, we're not going up morally, we're spiraling down. It's hard to watch anything on TV. You know, you watch, okay, I got to change it. I gotta, you know, it's just because it, it's frustrating. Belittling the things of God, it's just, it's so hard. So, so hard. So we have an appointed time. And because of that, we want to walk circumspectly and we want to use that time wisely. So we need to be alert. We need to realize that we have a, an appointed time, the appointment. But that brings us to the third thing I want to look at, and that's the apprehension in verse 17. Therefore, because of this, don't be unwise. Well, that's oh, obvious, right? Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Hmm. So Paul says, don't be unwise. I want you to, to be wise. And how's that? By understanding what the will of the Lord is. By the way, the term understanding in the original language means to exercise your mind. So I just want you to know, that just right off the bat, that discovering God's will is not a mystical thing that overrules your thinking. The very term understanding here means to exercise your mind. And I say that because there are a lot of Christians like, oh, what is the will of God? Oh, Lord, I know it's your will if you want me to go here. If a woman with rainbow hair with a big giant wart hanging off over here, then it'll be your will for me to do this. And it's like, what? That's just, that's just weird, you know. People do weird things. They get kind of mystical. Or they'll kind of like have so-called experience. I just felt like I felt the Lord. He wants me to do this thing. Why? Well, I don't know. I just had this weird feeling. Well, dude, that's just indigestion. <laughs> Take some pills for that. So 
I want you to know that God's will is involved with our mind. In fact, Romans 12 and verse 2 says this, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know, if your mind is renewed in Christ, that you may know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So understanding God's will and exercising our mind goes hand in hand. And the reason why Paul talks about this in conjunction with redeeming the time is this, is because without knowing God's will, we could be running around doing all kinds of things that may even be good things, but they're not the things that God wants us to do. And so we could be doing good things, but we're really not buying up the opportunities and we're not redeeming the time because it's not what God wants us doing. We can get involved with all kinds of programs or all kinds of things. It could be sports, sports, sports. We're off doing this. And I, mean, I don't have time for the Lord. Well, maybe that's not the Lord. No, it is. I know because I know my kids got to be in baseball their whole life or they got to be the best soccer or whatever it is, you know. And everything's focused on that or my hobby or whatever it is. I've got to golf eight hours a day. You got to know that besides my job, you know. Obviously exaggerating. But we can do things that aren't necessarily evil things but it crowds out the will of God. So Paul's desire is that we apprehend the will of God. Now, as I said, Romans chapter 12, being renewed in our thinking will allow us to do the will of God. Well, how do I renew my mind? Well, there are several ways. One is prayer. If you want to know God's will for your life, first of all, spend time in prayer. In fact, specifically in wisdom. It tells us actually in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. That means pray. And ask God for wisdom and he'll give it to you. Hello, there you go. So first of all, prayer. But not just specifically asking for wisdom, which is part of that, but also as I spend time with God in prayer, I find that God begins to transform my thinking. For example, a verse you're probably familiar with. It's Psalm 37 and verse 4. It says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You're like, that's an awesome verse. I, man, I've been wanting that new house, that brand new car. I'm, I'm in God's house. I'm delighting myself in the Lord. Okay, bring it, God, you know. Well, that's not what it means. What David was saying is I submit myself to God, as I delight myself in the Lord, in his plan, his will, his ways, what I find is over a period of time, his will becomes my will. His direction becomes my direction. The things that please him start becoming the things that please me. But all that is essential is spending time with God in prayer. Another thing that transforms our thinking is not only spending time with God in prayer, but is spending time, obviously, in his word. In his word, right? First of all, it's in connection with God's word that I come to know the Lord, that I get saved, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. In fact, Paul told Timothy, his protege, in 2 Timothy 3.15, from a childhood you learned the scriptures that made you wise to salvation. But beyond that, it's God's word that gives us wisdom to know his will, to know his will. So I, I know I've done an entire study on this, but I'm just going to kind of include this in here. That there are six things that we already know from God's word that is his will for your life. And sometimes we get off on all these little tangents, all these kind of mystical things. Well, should I take this job? Should I go to that college? Do this? Well, first of all, make sure you're doing the first six that we know are clearly in the scripture. So let me give them to you real quickly. They all begin with the letter S. Number one, it is God's will that you be saved. That's where it begins. That's where wisdom begins, right? Yeah. So it's God's will you be saved. How do we know that? 1 Timothy 2.4. God desires, it is God's will that all men be saved. It's right in the Bible. There you go. So number one, it's that you're saved. Number two, it is God's will that you be spirit-filled. Now that's different than being saved because when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. But being spirit-filled is something different. It's down in verse 18. We're gonna look at this in detail next time. It says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled. The term filled means to be controlled by, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So is your life in control of the Holy Spirit? You're doing all those things that the Holy Spirit wants to do. Holy Spirit wrote the scripture. You're doing the things that are in conjunction with God's word. So it's God's will that you be spirit-filled. Number three, it's God's will that you be sanctified. That's another S. Sanctify. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. Again, very clear. Even your sanctification that you abstain from sexual sin. 
The word sanctified means holy. It means you're holy. So if you're living a holy life, you're not living a life of sexual sin. Living in adultery, living with your... So there are people that are like, they're coming to church and I'm living with my boyfriend, girlfriend. Wow, man, I really want God's will, man. Lord, direct me. You're over here, man. That's where you're at. You're in the dark. You're not in God's will. You're not even going to know God's will because you're living in sin. You got to, first of all, get in the light. You understand what I'm saying? So it is God's will that you be sanctified. You're worried about where do I go to school, what do I do? This? But you got to be sanctified. You got to live a holy life. That's not a perfect life. That's not a sinless life. But it's a life saying, Lord, I want to live unto you, holy unto you. Number four, it is God's will that you live a life of submission. 1 Peter 2.13. Submit yourself to all the ordinances of men, for this is the Lord's will. So I'm a submissive person. I submit to people in authority, whether it's officers, whether it's uh, my government, whether it's the people I work for. In other words, there's humility. I'm a person who comes under authority, ultimately Jesus Christ, but those around me. In Ephesians 5.21, he says, submitting one to another. There's a submission, a mutual submission between brothers and sisters. But if I don't have a life of humility, a life of submission, I'm out of God's will. Number five, a lot of people don't like this one. Many times it's God's will that we suffer. 1 Peter 3, 17. For it is better if it be God's will that you suffer doing good. So there are times that you can be doing what is right, be right in the center of God's will, and right in the center of God's will, disaster. I've experienced that before. And again, and again, many times. Joseph's classic example in the Old Testament, he was right in the center of God's word, uh, will. Where did that get him? He gets thrown into a pit by his brothers. Thanks, guys. Nice bros. He gets put into slavery, sold into slavery. There he, he's under Potiphar. He's under submission to this man, but the wife accuses him of you know, raping her. He didn't. He gets thrown into prison. He's in prison. He gets forgotten in there. Years, years and years. And he didn't do anything wrong. It's like, wow. Yeah, until it was God's timing. And then, of course, we know that it was God's will because he gets lifted up to second in command, second only to Pharaoh. And God provides for his people through that whole process. So there are times, center of God's will, suffering. The last thing is this. This is another tough one. It's God's will that you be satisfied all the time. Satisfied. Check this out. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, not most things, in everything give thanks because this is the will of God for you. It's God's will that something bad happens. I got a flat tire. Thank you, Lord. That's awesome. Thanks. I lost my job, honey. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's awesome. It's God's will. Because he has a plan in it, right? Just thankful. So isn't it interesting that the word of God is very clear on these things. This is God's will. I be saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, willing to suffer, and satisfied. So here's the thing. When I'm doing that, my mind is renewed in the things of God in that, then you know what? God can very gently move me where he wants to direct me. And as I said, we'll talk about that more in detail when we talk about the spirit-filled life. So we see alertness, appointment, apprehension. We need to walk alertly. In other words, we're, we're walking where we're going as believers. Careful where we don't go. Careful where we do go. We need to realize that we have an appointed time, right? And because of that, we need to buy up those opportunities. And we need to walk with the apprehension of God's will for our life. I'll close with the words of J.I. Packer. He said this, It's not until we become humble and teachable, standing in awe of God's holiness and sovereignty, acknowledging our own littleness, distrusting our own thoughts and willing to have our minds turned upside down, can divine wisdom be ours? It comes to us as we're just humble. That's where it begins. Did you know that when you accepted Christ, you were given an entirely new and different life than your old one? In Ephesians 4, Paul says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds, 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned in Christ. If you want to learn more about what life in Christ looks like, keep coming back because the book of Ephesians has more to say. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Larger Than Life is a ministry out of Calvary, Houston. Are you in the area? We'd love to see you at our next service. If you'd like to know more, head on over to ltlradio.org. That's ltlradio.org. And while you're there, take advantage of the opportunity to download our mobile app. There are so many great resources available to you there. If you like podcasts, subscribe to the Larger Than Life podcast. Another awesome opportunity available to you on our website is the chance to partner with us in ministry. Just click on the Donate tab. You never know how far God will take your gift. And with that, it's time to say goodbye. We'll connect with you again on Larger Than Life.